It's a, it's a great uh, honor to welcome everybody to the second Rob Kosiel, um Grand Grand Rounds in in Heart Failure. This is a uh, a special event for for many of us who knew Rob well. He was a um, cardiology attending here from 2012 to 2018, roughly. He uh, was recruited by Mark and and I think by Jim also. Uh, uh, back to Boston, he did his advanced, uh, an advanced year of fellowship um, at Tufts and then came on and really um, helped transform the heart failure section to uh, a more modern section and had, I would say, pretty much unparalleled energy uh, and enthusiasm uh, to, to take what was really, a, a, I think, a good clinical section, but bring it to, uh, to the next level. And, and solidify our relationship with Tufts, which has been, you know, over the last few years, a really important part of this division. Um, unfortunately, Rob died a couple of years ago and, and has left certainly a void, I suspect, in the heart failure community and, and a legacy that, uh, um, that we uh, feel very committed to maintaining at this institution. We're fortunate to have Jim Ilderson as a, as a speaker. Jim, of course, knew Rob, and I, I'm sure we'll say a few words about him. Jim's been, uh, a pioneer in many areas in cardiology in Boston. He's been here his whole career, really uh, developing the nuclear section at Tufts and, and I think probably holding virtually every uh, important role in that society, as well as um, helping to build the Tufts section and now uh, assuming the role as division chief. Uh, I think we all know, we all know Jim from uh, uh, numbers of a number of interactions and I think uniformly, I would say you're one of the most respected uh, people in academic cardiology because of your collaborativeness, collaborativeness, your insights, and uh, and uh, the number of people you've mentored. So uh, we we are very thankful that you're here today, and would like to give you this small recognition of, of today's lecture. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Great introduction. Yeah, of course. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if, if if Kristen is on Zoom. I want to say hello and she, hello, Kristen. Um, I will tell you and thank you for the invitation. I will tell you a brief story about Rob and and um, you you are right. He was just this vibrating bundle of energy at all times. So he came to us as an advanced heart failure fellow from after doing cardiology at Duke, and you know as you can imagine, he immediately <clears throat> immediately made an impact on everybody. And he was an amazing guy. And about halfway through the year, you know, as we started talking about the next step, you know, we had already had a, a good relationship working with you all starting a billion years ago with Bev Laurel. And it was clearly, you know, time to, for things to evolve a little bit. So your chief at the time, Mark Josephson, called and said, you know, in his kind of way of talking, hey, well, you know, let's let's talk about this guy, Kosiol. And he said, well, how about if I come over to your office and we'll talk about it? And I, you know, I'm kind of a new chief of cardiology and he's an icon. And I said, you know, I'll come to your office, Mark. That's okay. So I came over here and he said, oh, let's split this guy. What do you think? I said, okay, <laughs> sounds, sounds good, Mark. Um, so we worked out the percentages and, you know, it was really, you know, we had, we had that kind of model going, but it, Rob took it really to another place, you know, worked about a third time here, a two thirds time here, about a third quarter time with us. And really started what what you all see now, and you know, booming in transplants and an amazing group of people in general, but the heart failure group. So you know, we all have an amazingly soft spot in our heart for him, and that's why it's particularly honor. Uh, it's a particular honor to be invited to do this. So thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to talk about something that I've been interested in a long time. So left ventricular remodeling and. What does that mean clinically and how can we weave it into clinical trials? There we go. Later, I'll talk about a clinical trial that we're involved in with a company called Levanova, but mostly it'll be very sort of a generic discussion. So this is a paper that was published about 15 years ago in the New England Journal from Joe Hill and Eric Olson. And it was about the plasticity um, of the left ventricle, the limits of hypertrophy and atrophy. So hypertrophy with chronic hypertension or other insults, pressure overload insults, and atrophy under conditions of starvation. And it was really about how the left ventricle 
you know, can change its shape and size, you know, almost more than any other organ. There might only be one other organ that can grow and shrink so quickly. And we see this, you know, all the time in pregnancy, you know, over the first few weeks and months of pregnancy, the volume overload, the LV enlarges, then there's birth and it goes back to normal. So it's, it's quite incredible. And we use this, we used to use this a lot more if we saw athletes and is it physiologic hypertrophy? Is it hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And we would decondition them and see if the LV went back to normal. We'd say, okay, that's an athlete. We don't really do that much anymore, but you know, this is this where this, how it clinically played out, remodeling and reverse remodeling. So today though, we're gonna talk about pathologic uh, remodeling and here in this uh, cartoon from a, a paper that, a review paper in Jack Imaging that Marv Constam and I wrote. It's post MI remodeling, some insult to the left ventricle and over time, the left ventricle changes its shape and size and function and you get um, uh, reduced EF and it eventuates in heart failure. So that's really <clears throat> the topic for today. And we'll cover briefly a historical perspective, the relation to long-term outcomes, the effect of drugs and devices, and how we can think about this in terms of surrogates for outcomes in clinical trials. What, is, what does a surrogate really mean in trials? And then finally, how can we weave this into sort of novel endpoints uh, for clinical trials? So I will say that this from this review by David Cass at Hopkins, this is not what I'm going to talk about. I am not a myocyte biologist. I am not a signaling pathway person. So what we're going to talk about today is um, the macro view. You know, what does is, what is the chamber enlargement and all of that mean clinically, <clears throat> clinically and in trials? All right. So a brief historical perspective. So back in the 1980s, uh, Mark Pfeffer and his late wife, Jan, uh, working with Dr. Brownwald, did a lot of the initial work on describing the process of left ventricular remodeling. And this is a schematic from uh, summarizing their rat model work really throughout the decade of the 1980s. And so they would um, induce a myocardial infarction in the lateral wall of a rat heart, and then over time, see that there was thinning and dilatation to maintain stroke volume. And over time, this, just, this process just kept going. And the left ventricle would enlarge, EF would go down, heart failure would ensue. So really, they, they were the ones who did many of the initial descriptions of this uh, back in the 1980s uh, here in Boston. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of the first clinical demonstrations was here, you know, at Beth Israel with your for former colleague, uh, Ray McKay, working with uh, Bill Grossman. So 30 patients um, with their first acute MI treated with thrombolytic therapy, something that many of you probably have never seen. And they had a cath and then they had a cath again, two weeks later, kind of thing that's hard to do now for research. And what they found was that over the two weeks after the infarct, end diastolic volume and end systolic volume increased, stroke volume was preserved, and interestingly, wedge pressure and LBN diastolic pressure went down. So even within the first two weeks after an MI, there was sort of an adaptive and maladaptive remodeling of the left ventricle to maintain stroke volume, you know, with LB enlargement, but with maintained or even lower pressures. This is actually one of the first clinical descriptions uh, back in 1986 of left ventricular remod post MI left ventricular remodeling. All right, so what does this mean? You know, is this prognostic? Does this mean anything in terms of outcomes? <clears throat> so these are some data from the SAVE trial, survival and ventricular enlargement. So po early post-MI, within a month post-MI, EF40 or less, randomized to captopril, 50 milligrams three times a day, or placebo blinded, that was the SAVE trial. And this was a subsequent analysis by Martin St. John Sutton, who did sort of the echo analysis from the SAVE trial. So let's walk through this. this is on the y-axis is the change in left ventricular area cross-sectional by echo over one year. And then they followed the, per, the, the patients from one year on for events. The blue are patients who didn't have events. The orange are people who did. And what you can see is that the change in the end diastolic LV area was much greater in people who had subsequent events after the first year, as was the change in end systolic volume. And quite interestingly, this was independent of randomization to captopril or placebo. So if you were on placebo and you didn't remodel over a year, you were at pretty low risk. If you were on captopril and you remodeled, you were at pretty high risk. 
But of course, there were fewer people who remodeled on captopril because of the effects of the ACE inhibitor. But this was probably the first demonstration that this process of remodeling post-MI ultimately was very prognostic. Now, of course, this was like a billion years ago and we don't have, you know, now in contemporary practice, a lot of different ways to treat people. Does this, does this still hold up? So now jump ahead in the time machine to 2020. Um, this is an echo study from Jerome Bax who does uh, these things so well. So about 2000 STEMI patients who had four echoes <clears throat> over the first year post MI and then eight years of follow-up quite, quite interestingly. And they defined remodeling <clears throat> as a, more than a 20% increase in end diastolic volume over the first year by echo. And so here from this Jack paper, you see that about on the right, about 50% of the patients had that remodeling over the first year. And this is the kind of like all comers with STEMI. And it still was quite prognostic in a contemporary era, really despite our contemporary therapies. Here you see the, the remodelers in orange and the non-remodelers in blue. And over the follow-up of a few years, it was still prognostic in a, in a more contemporary era than, than the SAVE trial. So this is still meaningful. You know, if you see this in a prognostic sense. So let's shift and talk about the, the trajectory of what we know about the effects of drugs and um, devices on, on this process. So back to Mark Pfeffer and, and Jan and, and Dr. Brownwalds in uh, mid 1980s. So this was um, in their rat models. And on the left, you see what they call the large, large MI in a rat. And on the right, you see extensive MI, which is larger than a large MI, yes. And this was the effect of captoprel. So the dotted, the dashed line is sort of the control. The solid line is after treatment with captoprel in these rats. And you see a favorable shift in the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. So this is the this was the beginning of the thought that we can it, that this process could be influenced by a drug. In this case, an ACE inhibitor, because they were really interested. It was they were really thinking about loading as opposed to neurohormonal antagonism at the time. But still, and again, this is very prescient. I think uh, thus, captopril attenuated the LV remodeling or dilation and the deterioration in performance observed in rats with a chronic MI from this paper. So very prescient. And they went on to do a randomized trial, captopril versus placebo. And see on the x-axis is a year follow-up and survival on the y-axis. And of course, this shows that the, the, those on captopril survive better over a year post-MI than those on water. And this is, of course, because it's in rats, not people. So there's a long-term long randomized trial in rats. And of course, they went on this amazing bench to bedside um, work here to use that as the basis for the SAVE trial, Survival and Ventricular Enlargement, published in 1992 in the New England Journal. Again, post-MILB dysfunction, captopril versus placebo, 20% reduction in mortality, you know, as, as you see here on the right. So attenuating remodeling seemed to translate into better survival over time. So we were, we were interested in this in more, that was post-MILB dysfunction. We were interested in, in the chronic state and we had the opportunity within the SOLVE trial, the studies of left ventricular dysfunction, chronic heart failure, LV dysfunction, just on diuretics and digoxin, enalapril versus placebo. And we, we had the opportunity to run the radionuclide core laboratory <clears throat> for the SOLVE trial. It's only three centers, us, Vanderbilt, and uh, Leuven in, in um, Belgium. And these are the data from that paper. So this is end diastolic volume index on the y-axis and multiple time points, baseline four months, 12 months, and almost three years on the x-axis. WD stands for withdrawal. So we built into this study that at the end of the trial, we stopped the enalapril or placebo, waited three or four weeks and repeated the, the radionuclide study. And that was the reason we did that was to see you know, if you give someone sublingual nitroglycerin, do an echo before and after, you know, the ventricle is going to get a little smaller. Has anything structurally changed? No, it's just a loading effect. So we wanted to see what happened to the left ventricle in the absence of the dose by dose loading of unloading effect of enalapril. So we stopped it for a couple of weeks. So what you see here in placebo in green is a steady increase in end diastolic volume index over the three years of the trial, 
That's the natural history, essentially, of left ventricular remodeling and chronic heart failure. In the enalapril group, there was a pretty quick reduction that was maintained over the course of the trial. And after withdrawal, you know, what you see here is it kind of crept up back to the, where it started three years earlier. But essentially, this difference is the net prevention structurally of remodeling in the absence of an acute drug effect on loading. So this was really the first demonstration, I think, in chronic heart failure, that this could be playing a role in the effects of a drug like enalapril, an ACE inhibitor, on outcomes. And of course, in the, in the solved treatment trial, published a little earlier than we got the radionuclide study out, there was a reduction in mortality um, enalapril compared to placebo in these, <clears throat> in these same patients. So, you know, the story began to evolve that maybe these things are related. So let's, let's create a little table here. So we have the solved treatment trial, enalapril, decreased volumes, decreased mortality. There was another part of the solved trial called the solved prevention study. These were asymptomatic people with left ventricular dysfunction, you know, also randomized to enalapril or placebo. And we also studied those people. There was a mild reduction in volumes. There was a mild, not quite statistically significant reduction, but directionally that way in mortality. And of course, I told you about the SAVE trial, decreased volumes, decreased uh, mortality. So that sounds good and consistent. Are these things related? Is it just related to this one drug class or does it not work in the other direction? So we needed to learn more. So you have to look at different drug classes. So let's look at beta blockers. So this was a trial called Capricorn. And the idea behind Capricorn was that the beta blocker post-MI trials that were done in the early 1980s, you know, BHAT with propranolol, the Timolol study, you know, it was a million years ago. Do we really know that in, at the time, contemporary post-MI practice with revascularization, thrombolytic therapy, aspirin, statins, does the beta blockers really have a role? So Capricorn was a study that asked that question. So post-MI LV dysfunction treated with everything that you would do in the early 2000s, randomized to carvedilol or placebo. A lot of people in the United States thought that was unethical to do. So it was mostly done in Europe because they, they think more literally about such things. So it, it was, I think there was one center in the US that said, okay. So anyways, six months, and what you see here is that the, this is an LV end diastolic volume. The placebo group increased end diastolic volume, the carvedilol group, that was prevented. EF was better and systolic volume was better. So carvedilol in this case had a favorable effect on post-MI LV remodeling in people with post-MI LV dysfunction. And in the main part of Capricorn, there was a 20-ish percent reduction in all-cause mortality. So let's, like, let's add that to our table here. So this is starting to look pretty good. That different drug that seems to hold up this relationship between the effect on volumes and the effect on mortality. So time marches on and other drugs. So this is a drug called ibopamine. And some of you in older, older heart failure people may remember this. It's a dopaminergic agonist that um, was being developed mostly in Europe in the early 90s. And so this was a phase two study, and we were working with our friends in Belgium who we had worked on with Solved. So they were running the trial. It was you know, exercise tolerance and symptoms, kind of a typical phase two heart failure trial at the time. And there was a bunch of radionuclide ventriculograms for, vol for volumes that they sent to us for analysis. And of course, you know, I was the very junior person drawing all the re little regions of interest blinded to everything. And we sent them back these data. So on the left is placebo, on the right is ibopamine, the y-axis rated nuclide ventricular gram volume, and this is over three months of time, baseline and follow-up in red. So in the placebo group, a pinch of an increase that wasn't really significant, so no change really over three months. Look at this. In the ibopamine group, volumes went up, not down. They went up. And again, we were blinded. They were really not happy with us you know, to show it in these data. And in the main trial, in the phase two trials, symptoms got better, exercise time got better. So they, they put this in like one sentence at the end of the results section, they kind of buried it, but it was there. So, you know, they went on to do a, a pivotal trial called PRIME2 and lo and behold, 
an unfavorable effect on mortality, a 26% increase in mortality with ibopamine compared to placebo. And you know, we were kind of quietly thinking, gee, told you so, <laughs> that was gonna happen. So volumes increased, mortality increased. Next up, um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a lot about in the heart failure world about inflammation driving um, heart failure outcomes. So um, anti-inflammatory drugs, in this case, etanercept, began to be studied. So this is back in 2001, and many of you know Beacon Boskert, who was uh, current editor of Jack Heart Failure, president of the Heart Failure Society recently. This was when she was a fellow with Doug Mann in um, Texas. So 47 patients with somewhat advanced heart failure. This is biweekly subcutaneous injections or placebo, nicely done, blinded echoes. And then what you see here is kind of a dose response to the effect of a tannercept on ejection fraction. High, you know, placebo goes down, higher doses go up. Same thing, really nice data. And you know, when you see a dose response, you know, that, that solidifies really what you're finding. However, in the pivotal trial, you know, so we thought, wow, that's going to play out very well. I'll put my money on that. But nope, this one, the Tannercept, this was a large pivotal trial, uh, phase three trial run by Doug Mann. Absolutely no effect of a Tannercept in chronic heart failure with LV dysfunction, which now we call HEF-REF. Um, so that was a little disappointing for us. And <laughs> we thought we had a really nice table going here. But, you know, it began to make us think that, you know, nothing perfectly predicts anything else. I mean, biology is really complicated. So maybe this is more of a probability signal and not so tightly correlated as a surrogate. So that brings us into the topic, you know, of surrogate for clinical outcomes, which is, again, this area just leads naturally into thinking about that. So let's step back. And those of you who participate in trials, particularly in heart failure, know that regulatory approval for a new entity for heart failure requires either a favorable effect on outcomes, and that could be survival, cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalizations used as a, as a marker of progression, or a favorable effect on symptoms in some way, symptoms or function with sufficient outcome data to exclude some bad effect. So either of those are okay. You know, all the trials you see in the New England Journal usually have the first one, favorable effect on outcomes. And we're, you know, we're lucky in the heart failure world to have, you know, amaz an amazing evidence base, but you don't need that to get a new drug approved. You can have a favorable effect on symptoms. And as you know, from the trials that you see every day, trial population sizes for new heart failure drugs are now thousands of patients. You know, they're hard to mount and hard to do and really expensive. They're, they are done. So there's a lot of interest in identifying markers in phase two studies that can predict phase, th <clears throat> phase three success or failure, something to give you, you know, a red light, a green light, or maybe even a yellow light about whether you should or, or shouldn't go on. So you know, that's, that's what I'd like to talk about in the next few minutes. And what does is, what is actually a surrogate mean? You know, we talk about that all the time. So these two papers, one in statistics and medicine by Prentice, you know, very technical, but if you want to read something more accessible, um, Tom Fleming and Dave Demetz in the Annals of Internal Medicine, 1996. So I summarized both of these. When is a marker a strong surrogate? So number one, the surrogate is in the causal path between the intervention and the outcome. Number two, all intervention effects pass through the marker in that causal path. And number three, changes in the marker are reflected in changes in the outcome. And so it's actually on these two words that almost every marker in cardiology uh, gets hung up. It is a really, really high bar, strict, strictly speaking. Um, okay, so you, is, we're gonna pause for a quiz here. Um, you are the new chief medical officer of Megacore Drug Company. The CEO charges you with selecting two drugs to move into phase three from their portfolio of drugs with phase two results. You know, and no pressure, you know, phase three trials cost bazillions of dollars. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna give you five choices of phase two. I'm gonna ask you to vote for two of them. So number one, a drug for hef, hef ref that doubles natriuretic peptide levels goes up 
compared to placebo in two phase two trials. A neurohormonal modulator for HEFREF that raises ejection fraction four points compared to placebo over 20 weeks. A drug for HEFREF in which two of three phase two trials showed a reduction in natriuretic peptide levels. Number four, a drug for HEFPEF that has no effect on echo LA volume, LA volume at 24 weeks. And number five, an IV vasodilator for acute heart failure that lowers natriuretic peptides over two days infusion and oh, shows lower mortality at six months. Okay, who would vote? You get two choices, please raise your hands and participate. Who would vote for number one? No one, okay. Uh, number two, EF raise. Okay, well, everybody kind of watch the heart failure people and see what they're doing. Uh, number three, two phase two trials show a reduction in nature of the peptide levels. Okay, a few of you. Four, no effect on LV volume. No one likes that one. Um, and five, okay, all right. So really no one voted for one, two, two three and five were your favorites. All right, let's, let's see how you did and whether you hold on to your job. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, well, Rob is the only one who holds on to his job. You are all, the rest of you are out. So drug number one is metoprolol succinate, Topol XL, which has a 33% reduction in mortality. In early trials, it raised natriuretic peptide levels. Rob, nicely done, well done. Number two, is a drug called moxonidine. That was a central sympatholytic. It raised EF, but killed people when it was studied, 60% increase in mortality. Number three is a liscarin, which is a direct renin inhibitor. It was eventually approved for hypertension. No one uses, I don't think. Um, two phase two to reduce Zen natriuretic peptide, sounds good, completely neutral in heart, large heart failure trials. Number four that no one voted for, spironolactone in HEFPEF. If you just look at the Americas, remember you, you forget about Russia and Georgia in that trial, 18% reduction in the primary endpoint, no effect on LA volume. And number five is serolaxin. You know, it's amazing phase two data. The company went to the FDA. They said, please do a phase three trial. They did, there was no effect on outcomes, even though the phase two did and, and lowered nature of peptide. So this is, it's a tough biz, you know, drug development. And the surrogate business is particularly difficult. And so biomarkers that we think of as prognostic are not necessarily good surrogate markers. And we know this in cardiology, like those of you who've been around remember a billion years ago, PVCs, very unfavorable prognosis post MI, suppress PVCs in the CAS trial, increased mortality. More recently, we of course know that low HDL increases the risk of incident CAD, increased HDL would be a bazillion dollar drug, nope. Torcetropib and those drugs and illuminate 15,000 patients increased mortality. You know why? You know, off target effects. You know, there's a lot of things that can happen and surrogates don't necessarily work. And the amazing thing is that even outcomes don't predict outcomes. So, what I mean by that. So, here's some data New England Journal, 1993, a drug called Vesnarinone, sort of an oral, milrinone, fancy milrinone drug that was very promising. So this was uh, some data from a phase two study and the outcomes, morbidity, mortality outcomes were not the primary endpoint. Bill, Bill Colucci published this, he was the first author, but look at this, the top morbidity and mortality over just a relatively short time. That's a pretty good p-value. Doesn't that mean there's only three chance in a thousand that that's incorrect? Mortality, zero, zero, two, that's pretty good. So the company, Otsuka, went to the FDA with their phase two data, and the FDA said, no, you know, when, you're, when it's not a high up endpoint, it's not really pre-specified, not powered, you know, yes, we see it, sounds good, but it's not robust. And those of you who, you know, are reading carefully, you, you know, see it's only about 400 patients, you know, 10, 15%. All of, these, all of these are based on like 50 events, and that's not robust at all. So they went ahead and did a pivotal trial called BEST, the Vesnarinone Evaluation of Survival Trial. And the opposite happened. A few years later, in New England Journal, there was a dose-dependent increase in mortality. Now, why? Again, who knows why? 
So even outcomes don't predict outcomes. That's how hard this prediction business is. So, you know, there's, of course, why is this? Because if you think about people with heart failure, LV dysfunction, and sort of their progression, you know, a lot of different things can happen that affect their outcome that doesn't, isn't captured in, you know, natriuretic peptides. You can have another acute MI, you can have arrhythmias or sudden death, you can not adhere to your therapy and progress. You can have neurohormonal driven remodeling, you can have worsening kidney function, worsening mitral regurgitation. So why should any of these capture, you know, what's going on? It's, it's really complicated. So it's unlike, you know, we, you know, our thinking was evolving and we thought it's unlikely that any individual marker will represent the heterogeneous pathways of progression with precision. But maybe you don't need to be so super precise. You know, maybe the magnitude of a correlation can give you a probability signal and kind of get away from the strict definition and just think about these things as probability signals. And maybe you can weave that into trials. So that's that was our thinking. And okay, how would you know that? So ideally, the relation of a treatment effect on remodeling to the outcome effect would come from large randomized trials in which all patients have the biomarker measured of interest and all patients have outcomes. And you know, in heart failure trials, that's hard to do. In cholesterol lowering trials, that's not so hard to do. You know, everyone gets an LDL at four or six months and everyone's followed for outcomes. So it's easier to create data like this from um, Mike Silverman, who's not, this was at, when he was, I think, a fellow at the Brigham with Mark Sabatine. And this was published a few years ago in JAMA. So the x-axis is the between group difference in achieved LDL corrected for placebo. And the y-axis is the risk of major vascular events over time. And you know what? You see a nice relationship. It's not perfect. There's some scatter and confidence intervals, but there's a general relationship that you can use to potentially predict what's going to happen. But in heart failure trials, imaging biomarkers like echo you know, remodeling, we don't have those kind of data because thousands and thousands of echoes really expensive and it's hardly ever done with some exceptions like the Valhef trial. So we don't have those data, but so how can you kind of get around that and figure it out? So you know, our hypothesis that we started with was that drug or device effects on remodeling have some correlation with drug device effects on outcomes. So, okay, so now, you know how all, all of you on the staff, you know, all of your interns who wanna go into cardiology, you know how they come and meet with you early in the year to get involved and stuff very early. So one popped into my office a bunch of years ago and I just so happened to be thinking about this. And I said, Dan, how about just go out and step one, find every outcome trial that's ever been done in the last 30 years in heart failure. And he said, okay. And you know how some like half the time they never come back, <laughs> but he came back. And so we thought, let's identify every drug who we know the outcome. And so he came back and this is, this is what he put together. So at the times, this is sort of late 2000s, there were 25 interventions that had 70,000 ish patients with long, you know, relatively long follow-up, but we could say, this is just mortality, very simple. And we category bucketed them into favorable effect, meaning the upper bound of the confidence interval is less than one, neutral confidence intervals cross one, or unfavorable effects on mortality, lower bound is greater than one. So, you know, over here on the left, there are all the drugs you recognize for HEFREF. Here are others that have been studied. And on the right, drugs many of you have never heard of because they failed a long time ago. So, okay, now we have the outcome part of the equation. Now, step two, find every remodeling trial that's ever been done with those drugs. So he went off again, came back a few months later, and there were almost 90 trials with 20,000 patients. And then let's correlate those two. So, okay, so here's what happened. So this is a, actually a really highly cited paper in Jack. I mean, my career is all downhill from here. This was the, the peak. So on the x-axis is the placebo corrected change in EF over time in these phase two remodeling trials. On the y-axis is the odds ratio for death in the large RCTs. And what you see here is a general relationship. It's not fabulous, but there's a gen the, the better the change in EF, the more likely the blue here are those in the favorable category, the black are neutral and the red are adverse. And so each data point, these aren't patients, these are trials. So for instance, here at 
0.67, these are all carvedilol trials here, because it had a 0.67 reduction in the odds of mortality, and in general made the EF go, go up quite a bit. So we also did this for end diastolic volume. And again, some relationship here, the better the reduction in end diastolic volume, the more likely that that drug or device would play out as favorable on mortality over time. And we had a very talented statistician working with us who put it together in this way, so that let's say you had a 15 milliliter reduction in end diastolic volume corrected for placebo, you know, on the basis of these data, you could say, well, it's about a 75% chance of a favorable outcome in phase three, maybe a 20-ish percent chance of an, of an uh, neutral effect and a very low chance, not zero, but very low of an adverse event. So, you know, we thought these data would be useful in developing um, drugs and devices. And, you know, I get actually even now calls all the time from companies saying, oh, can you tell us about these data? So, you know, we think that those markers are probably the best that there are. You know, people think of natriuretic peptides as very good for this and they're, you know, excellent prognosis. I mean, there's so much about them and you can use them clinically. But what about for this purpose? It turns out actually they're not very good for this purpose. We did kind of the same analysis. Uh, this is uh, Ben Wessler, who's now one of our superstar junior faculty. This is when he was a fellow. Same thing, mortality trials, then the natriuretic peptide effects of those drugs and devices. And as you can see here, um, there's no effect at all. We actually had a lot of trouble getting this paper published because it goes kind of against what people think, I think. Um, there really wasn't that much of an effect. Here's Entresto, now that works pretty well, lowers natriuretic peptides, improves outcomes. Um, over here, by the way, here's metoprolol succinate, doubles, this is the percent change, doubles natriuretic peptides, and of course, has a fantastic effect on mortality. So, you know, when you think about it in this way, you know, again, an individual drug or situation, it might work, but in general, natriuretic peptides are not that good for this. So in terms of surrogates, no biomarker or change with therapy is likely to precisely capture the complex mechanisms that drive heart failure progression. But for phase two randomized trials, a drug or device effect on remodeling can potentially provide a probability signal of success or failure in phase three. And I think that's how you have to think about it. You can use these biomarkers as potential signals of efficacy, you know, and it's all about risk and, and reward. And if you're a regulator, you know, maybe you would allow us you know, to incorporate these things in novel ways, um, in novel composite endpoints. And that's what I'd like to focus on in the last couple of minutes. How can you take these concepts and weave them in potentially um, to developing drugs and devices that will help our patients? So here's the problem <clears throat> these days in heart failure trials. So on the left, 20 years ago, a valiant trial, Valsartan or Captoprel or the combination versus placebo on post-MILV dysfunction. And if you just isolate the one-year event rate, it was about 20% of patients had an event by one year. You know, jump ahead 10 plus years to the Paradigm and Tresto trial, you know, not somewhat similar patients. You know, now event rate at one year is only 10 to 15, 10 to 15%. So if you're doing you know, cardiovascular death, heart failure, hospitalization outcomes, you know, you have to study thousands of patients because only 10-ish percent of patients are having events that you can see a reduction in. That's why these trials are so large. And so, you know, as many of you know, the trial science has evolved and there's a lot of new ways to do this. And one that you see all the time now is using hierarchical composites. And I think it might be best referred to as general pairwise comparisons the win, often referred to as the win ratio or the finkelstein schonfeld method. We'll talk about that in a second. And then the FDA has allowed pathways, faster pathways, one known as accelerated approvals. So let's, let's first talk about um, the win ratio for a second. This paper actually just came out a couple of weeks ago in Jack. And I think it's one of the best reviews of this topic. The nomenclature is very confusing. And so if you're just looking for one thing to read that explains this, check this out from just a couple of weeks ago. So this all started back in 1999 when um, Diane Finkelstein and David Schoenfeld, who are biostatisticians at MGH, published this paper in Statistics and Medicine. And they described a hierarchical comparison of events or timing in pairs of patients. 
The analysis, the hierarchy accounted for clinical priority. Death is more important than heart failure hospitalization. But it allowed, the, the real advance here, I think, was a, a, allowing into that hierarchy a longitudinal change in something, you know, whether it's end diastolic volume, six minute walk test, KCCQ, that, that had not been done before. And this enables every, almost every patient to contribute to the endpoint, not 10% of the patients. And then there's a way to incorporate uh, recurrent events. So let's illustrate this in a, in a way that uh, you know, I think is simple to understand. So let's say you have a new cell therapy and you treat 100 patients in group A in your randomized trial and group B you treat with placebo. So how do you use the win ratio here? So basically you take pairs of patients. So let's take patient number one from group A, patient number 22 from group B, and you ask the first part of the hierarchy, did either of them die? Well, in most of our trials, some people die. So if patient B died in this pair, A wins that comparison. But most of the time, neither die. You know, death is very uncommon. In, in even large heart failure trials, it's single digit percent. So most of the time in the pairs, no one dies. So you go on to the next level of the hierarchy where either hospitalized for heart failure. If B was hospitalized, A wins that pair. Um, but if neither, and again, as I said, 80 to 90% of people neither, neither die or are hospitalized, you go on to the third component, which could be anything, a longitude, some longitudinal measure, let's say change in end diastolic volume. And if A went up five and B went up 25 over, let's say a year, A wins that comparison. And you do that for, you compare every patient in A to every patient in B, and you have 10,000 comparisons. And the win ratio is essentially just the wins, wins of A divided by the wins of B. And there's a way to calculate a variance and a p-value. And, and that's really it. And this, this is now, you know, back then it was very new. Now you see it everywhere. Um, and why might we think about end diastolic volume here? And why might the FDAs think that's okay? Because there's a plausible relation to outcomes. Again, if you're using KCCQ, that's self-evidence, you know, what that means. But markers can go in here as long as there's some plausible relation to outcomes. So again, you see this all the time. Now, uh, one of the first drugs to get approved on this basis using this analytic construct, you know, was tofamidus for amyloid cardiomyopathy. You know, when you think about that New England Journal paper, most, most people think about the reduction in all-cause mortality and the reduction in heart failure or cardiovascular hospitalizations. But the primary endpoint analysis was a win ratio. And this was, I think, the first one um, to be approved on that basis. The win ratio was in cardiology. The, work, the win ratio was 1.7, and there's p-value associated with that. And you know, there it was. So this is out there and being used. Journals have, have evolved in, in how they let people uh, illustrate this. This is something, um, oops, sorry about that. It's this New England Journal 2023, missed that. So this is the step hef trial of semaglutide in obese patients with um, HEF-PEF. And again, it was a win, win ratio was the uh, secondary endpoint, but I'm showing this, this is, the, this is the way you'll see this illustrated now, I think in most journals that, you know, the, the um, orange is the semaglutide winner, the blue is the placebo winner. So it allows you to see every component of the hierarchy and which was here, death, heart failure events and KCCQ, even at different levels of difference. But you know, when you quickly scan this, you can see that most of the outcome in the step HEF-PEF trial was driven by KCCQ and very, very little had anything to do with death or heart failure hospitalization. And that, that might be okay. You know, symptoms getting better is really important. And then the win ratio was shown down here. So again, this now you see it everywhere. Uh, atrial shunt device trials, every one of them is using a win ratio as their primary endpoint. Um, the impulse SGLT2, empagliflozin, or, um, early post-discharge for heart uh, worsening heart failure. This, this is everywhere. So another, another way we've thought to in, incorporate these concepts about remodeling into clinical trials mm -hmm. is, is with the FDA's expedited access and accelerated approval. And essentially, accelerated approval is for, this is from the FDA guidance, you know, for serious medical conditions, unmet medical needs, you can get initial approval, temporary in a way, with a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. 
So it doesn't say, it doesn't use the word surrogate here, but there, there it does, but reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. So we've actually woven this in to a trial called Anthem, which is vagal nerve stimulation. And this is the accelerated endpoint composite here. There, has, there had to be a trend in the right direction for the primary endpoint, cardiovascular death, heart failure, hospitalization. There had to be good safety. But the device group at FDA let us put change in EF, you know, ba basically on the basis of the data I showed you a few minutes ago. And that has not really been done before. The, the drug group at FDA still is not, they're getting there, but they're not quite there. But that's, that's how we have been able to use these concepts to get into clinical trials. So in our time together this morning, I've walked through the, the history of remodeling and the relation to outcomes, effective drugs, and the concepts of surrogates and how maybe we can use these innovative concepts to in, inform drug development and get drugs and devices that work you know, faster uh, to our patients. So again, I really appreciate the invitation. And I'll just conclude by saying uh, LV remodeling is a stereotypical response to injury or loading. Remodeling is associated with adverse outcomes and is a fundamental driver of heart failure progression. The remodeling response to a therapy provides a probability signal of the outcome response of that therapy. And this concept can be leveraged into novel trial designs to enhance the likelihood of an outcome response with smaller sample sizes, we hope. We hope. And again, um, thank you, oops, wrong way. Thank you so much for the wonderful invitation. And I always have amazingly wonderful memories of Rob and our, our work with you with him. Thanks so much. Any questions? Should I, do I look at the chat? Okay, oh, okay. It, it absolutely could be. You know, it's um, there's there's some papers out there by Pocock that Scott Solomon was involved in where they went back to trials that used, you know, standard time to event and incorporated some of these things and in some of them found different results. So absolutely, you know, oftentimes you won't have that third components, you know, from those trials because that wasn't prospectively designed, but absolutely you can find, you know, different, different results. Jen? Oh, good. Well, that's how I understand. That's the only way I can understand it. So thank you. You know, it's a really good question. Um, you know, one company, I think it's called Cardior, is using mRNA technology and they're, they're in their phase two, they're focusing on hypertrophy regression, you know, as a marker, you know, analogous <clears throat> to hypertension trials. So maybe that's right. You know, we already know in um, TopCat, there was not a good relation. You know, uh, so it depends. I mean, you have to find out, you know, in, at least in HEFREF, you know, there's three decades of data to kind of cull. In HEFPEF, there's less data to, and less drugs. In other words, it's only in the last couple of years that we have drugs that affected it favorably outcome-wise. So you need sort of that part of the equation to figure out, you know, it, if any of the markers you know, might be helpful or even natriuretic peptides. So I think at the moment, there's probably not quite enough data to figure that out. What is your, you know, I'll, I'll read the question. What is your insight regarding impacts of heart failure therapy on end systolic volume changes? Yeah, that's, that's a, the question always comes up when you talk to people in the industry or designing trials, you know, which one do we use EF, end diastolic volume, end systolic volume? People tend to want to use end systolic volume because somehow that feels the best. But at least in the analysis we did, there were, that was the marker with the least amount of data 
And so, yes, there was a signal like the one I showed you, but much wider confidence intervals. Amazingly, there was just a lot less data in literature. So, you know, EF, you know, with all its problems, actually possibly works the best in, in diastolic volume next. Marsha? Thanks very much for a fantastic talk, and, and thank you for coming to the Howard Law. Uh, um, I, I enjoyed also sort of remind, you know, a reminder of the historical perspective of this. Um, in a lot of the early animal work in the early trial, it really focused on infarct cardiomyopathy. Uh, my question is as, <coughs> as the trials have gotten larger and larger, we sort of moved away and really, you know, we're, we're looking at patients with. Epiraph, whether they're infarct or non infarct cardiomyopathy. What do we know about the, the relationships that you, that you sort of nicely highlighted between surrogate outcomes, the surrogate um, endpoints and outcomes? Is there any difference in terms of the signal towards one type of product mortality myopathy here type versus the other? Yeah, there, there is if you dig deep. Um, so, for instance, in um, beta blockers, there is a greater increase in ejection fraction in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy than there is in ischemic cardiomyopathy, as you might hypothesize there's more muscle to improve. <laughs> However, um, and um, ischemic, non-ischemic with Entresto, there's a pinch of a difference that's detectable, same direction, I think. However, that has never played out you know, in outcome trials, you know, if you look back on every outcome trial in the last 30 years in F, what we now call HEFREF, there has never been a differentiation between ischemic, non-ischemic, you know, in the subgroup diagram, it's always the same. So whatever might, might play out in remodeling has not played out clinically. And we don't say I'm going to treat ischemics like this or not. And, you know, as you know, these days, even revascularization barely plays out, you know, with revived BCS, you know, we might not even need to know if they have ischemic cardiomyopathy. In fact, you know, and we, in, a, in aspirin, we don't actually know whether that's helpful. In statins, we actually don't really know that's helpful. So you can almost, if you're super reductionist, you know, don't don't do the cath. <laughs> I know it's blasphemy. <laughs> Go ahead, Rob. Putting this paradigm, what do do Never, never. Journals love journals love them too much. <laughs> well, well, one. Of, I'm not sure. I mean, first of all, journals love subgroup, and you know that's why there are so many journals. You know, um, so um, one of the problems I think that people have with the win ratio is you know you have a number, okay, one point seven. Okay, so there's 70% more wins. But when you look, you know, like I showed with the step HEF-PEF trial, you know, it has almost nothing to do with death or hospitalization. It's all KCCQ. You know, other trials go the other way. So it's, it's a simple descriptor that clinicians, you know, may not be able to parse out in terms of what does it really mean? You know, it's help, I think you can say, it's helpful to patients in some way and then like in that step pef pef you can discuss with your patients you know this is mostly symptomatic we really don't know you know on the long term outcomes is this going to do anything um, the, you know there are there are win ratio subgroups you know in all trials so no we won't get past that <laughs> might, might another another thing to parse into subgroups that's right okay okay oh hey ernie Time no see. Many patients with low EF after MI are being discharged on RNA4 drug, FAB4 therapy. In these patients, if the EF normalized, are there any data suggesting whether the drug should be uh, continued indefinitely, especially if there's no heart failure symptoms? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, so there was a trial a few years ago in Europe called TRED, T R E D, heart failure, where they took people that we would now call improved um, EF and they randomized them to taper and withdraw or continue. And what happened was about 50% of the taper and withdraw people dropped their EF and everyone was put back and most of them, but not all kind of went back. So, you know, at this point, um, it's, I would say it's not, you don't have to be incredibly rigid, but if I had an EF of 30 and I got put on all these drugs and it went up to 55, and then, you know, what I do is I wait 
four to six months and see if it's still 55, is our nature of peptides, nor is everything normal, normal? You know, I'll have a discussion. If it's, you know, it's a 40 year old, you know, maybe they don't want to be on four drugs for another 40 years, but I won't, I won't, I might withdraw the spiro because maybe that's not the most important. So most, but the recommendation generally is keep, keep them on, not, not withdraw. Oh, what are your thoughts on using CPET as a primary endpoint in clinical trials? Um, so it is, you know, it's great um, and it is used and it's a basis of approval for FDA. And in fact, that was Mavicampton for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A lot of the HCM drugs are having peak VO2 and from CPET as part of their uh, basis of approval. So it absolutely is important you know, reflects functional capacity, a little complicated to do in trials, but it's done. And, you know, Greg Lewis, one of the best core labs in the world. Many people use him for that. You all have done this many times. How it relates to quality of life, you know, it's a little trickier. I think, you know, there's a general relation. Um, we can measure quality of life with KCCQ if that's what you're interested in. And most trials do that now, and you have both pieces of information. So, you know, I, I think it, it's very important and it's used and you will see it more, you know, as, as you know, after Entresto, I, I was thinking, oh, we've sort of plateaued, you know, on outcomes, but no, then SGLT2s come along. But at some point we'll plateau, you know, and then it'll be more about symptoms and function. Will? Yeah, that was great. Um, Rob, would be super curious. I'm wondering like your thoughts on just the win ratio and sort of the outcomes of the conservational data sets as opposed to clients. And what do you really get how much it costs for our clients? How much data we now have from vectors and observational data sets and longitudinal high failures and so forth? And can we be using observational data and still using that win ratio type? to get a sense of whether something is or is that I'll answer. I'm feeling already very out over my skis here. <laughs> um, is Bobby here? No. You can ask, ask him. Um, you know, you have to, of course, have comparator groups and, of course, and you know, to have pick out one, a pair from two groups to compare. So in theory, of course, and then there's the usual conundrum and observational data about how to make those groups, you know, com baseline comparable with, you know, any of the million techniques that you know, I don't know too much about. So in theory, absolutely, you know, once you have some baseline comparisons. Well, yeah, yeah. The problem is that what you, you know, it, it's not just about the relation of the change to the outcome. So in other words, you would say, well, let's look at over time how EF changes and how end diastolic volume changes and how just end systolic volume changes and the relation to the outcome in this, you know, large database. But it's, it's the therapy induced change compared to not doing it that doesn't, you can't, really get out of observational data as easily. That's the problem. Great, thank you all very, very much.